In this video, we're going to discuss the role of a component called an accumulator, and we'll look at how we go about sizing an accumulator in order to meet our pressure requirements for a given system. So just before we carry out any calculations, let's just briefly discuss the diagram on the left-hand side. Now in the bottom left-hand corner, we have our hydraulic power pack, which is going to provide pressure or oil to our system. Now if we ignore the accumulator for a moment, the oil is going to flow into the system and it's either going to cause the extension of the actuator if it flows in through this pool or it's going to cause the retraction of the cylinder if it flows in through this pool. At the junction here we would have a component called a directional flow control valve and all that valve does is redirect the oil either into the back of the cylinder or the front of the cylinder depending on what we're trying to achieve. Now the new component that we see is called an accumulator. And as we can see here, the oil can also flow into the accumulator. If we didn't have an accumulator, our pump would have to be running all of the time in order for our cylinder to extend and retract. But we have an alternative because what we can do is we can charge the accumulator. And as we charge the accumulator, it fills with oil. As it fills with oil, the piston moves upwards. This type of accumulator is a mass-fed or gravity-fed accumulator. So as we charge the accumulator, we're giving the system potential energy by raising this mass, M. Now the advantage of doing this is once the accumulator is fully charged, we can switch off our pump and we're still able to supply our cylinder with the required pressure. Now the reason I've opted for the mass-loaded accumulator is because it's an easier concept to understand. What we can see is the work done by the fluid lifts the mass, it gives the mass potential energy, and that potential energy can then be supplied to the system. Now there are different types of accumulator, and one that's commonly used is a cylinder which contains a bladder or a bag of inert gas, usually nitrogen. So if you can imagine, let's say we have a cylinder, and inside that cylinder we have a bag of an inert gas such as nitrogen. Now in this type of accumulator, oil flows into the cylinder, but oil is incompressible. We can't reduce the volume of oil and give it more pressure energy. So instead what happens is we reduce the volume of the bladder of gas. And what we end up with is pressure energy stored, or stored pressure inside the gas. Now once again we can stop running our pump once the accumulator is charged and we can reuse that stored energy whilst the pump isn't running. But as mentioned the mass loaded accumulator is a more simple concept to understand although it does give us a basic understanding of the role of an accumulator. So returning to our example then, if we can determine the system pressure that we require we can then determine the mass that needs to be applied to the accumulator and that's what we're going to do in this example. Now once again we've been given force requirements and we've been given the diameter of the piston head of our cylinder. Notice that the force requirements are for the extension stroke, so the applicable area is the full bore area of the cylinder. We're dealing with the extension of the cylinder here. Now we've also been given the diameter of the accumulator. And as we can see here, the accumulator is really just another cylinder. We have a force acting downwards. That force acts across an area which is going to pressurise our oil. So we need to determine the force and then the mass that will provide us with the same pressure requirement for our double acting cylinder. Let's begin by calculating the required pressure. Now pressure is just force divided by area. And we know our desired force is 145 kilonewtons, so 145 times 10 to the 3, or 145,000, whichever you prefer. And the area that we need to use here, because we're looking for the extension force for the double acting cylinder, is the area of the piston head. Well, the area of the piston head is pi times the radius of the piston head squared. Well, we've already said that the diameter of our piston head is 42 millimetres. Therefore, the radius of our piston head 
is half of that, which is 21 millimeters. Now 21 millimeters needs to be expressed in meters. So dividing that by a thousand, we get 0.021 meters. And we need to square that in our formula. Therefore, the system pressure that we need to achieve or the pressure we need to hold in the system to allow for that extension force is 104.7 megapascals. OK, so let's take a look at what we know. We know that we need a pressure of 104.7 megapascals behind our piston head here in order to achieve a force on extension of 145 kilonewtons. Now that same pressure must exist throughout our system. Therefore that pressure must exist in the base of the accumulator here. Now in order to achieve that pressure, we can calculate the area of the accumulator. And if we know the area of the accumulator, we can calculate this downward force. So let's start again with our original formula. Pressure equals force over area. Therefore, the force acting down in the accumulator is pressure times area. We know our system pressure and we can determine the area of the accumulator. I'm just going to make one slight change here because the force acting downwards is the force due to our mass M. So in actual fact, the force acting downwards has a specific name and that name is weight. So we have the weight of the mass or the weight of the object on the top of the accumulator acting downwards causing the pressure in our system. Therefore weight equals pressure times area and it's the area of the accumulator. Okay so our weight or the weight of the mass on top of the accumulator is our pressure 1 0 4.7 times 10 to the 6, that's our system pressure, times the area of our accumulator. And the area of the accumulator, again, is pi times the radius of the accumulator squared. We have the diameter of our accumulator at the top, 220 millimeters. Therefore, the radius of the accumulator is half of that value, so 110 millimeters. 110 millimetres divided by 1,000 is 0.11 metres. And we're going to use that in our formula, so 0.11 squared. That's now in metres. Okay, so the weight of our accumulator equals 3,978,458. Now I'm going to express that in mega newtons. So what we actually have there is 3.978 meganewtons. That's the weight of the mass on the accumulator. Now I've written that answer down as 3.978 meganewtons, but I'm going to keep the full calculator answer in my display, and we'll see why in a moment. Now we've determined the weight, but what we really want to know is the mass in kilograms. So what physical mass is sitting on top of that accumulator? Well, we have another formula we can use here. Now you're probably familiar with the formula force equals mass times acceleration. And a variant on that is weight equals mass times gravity, where weight is a force and gravity is the downward acceleration due to freefall or the acceleration due to gravity. And that has a specific value on Earth of 9.81. So let's rearrange that formula for the mass. And we get mass is just weight divided by gravity. So we have our weight of 3.978 mega, so times 10 to the 6, divided by gravity of 9.81. And here's the reason why I kept the full calculator answer in my display, because 3.978 times 10 to the 6 is quite a heavily rounded answer. In actual fact, the answer is 3.9784805. So I'm going to use the full calculator answer to improve accuracy. And I'm going to divide by 9.81 for gravity. And I get an answer of 405,551 kilograms. So 4, 
5,551 kilograms. Now finally, I'm going to express that answer in metric ton. Now a metric ton is a thousand kilograms. So all I need to do is divide that answer by a thousand and I get 405.6 metric ton. So what that demonstrates is a significant mass is required in order to create the downward force requirement. And that downward force is what's responsible for pressurizing our oil. Okay, let's look at one final calculation. And this time we're going to look at the displacement of our accumulator that leads to the full extension of our cylinder. So in effect, how many times can the cylinder extend and retract on one full charge of the accumulator? So for the final part of this video, we're going to keep things as simple as possible. And the way that we're going to do that is by introducing something called the movement ratio. And the movement ratio is a ratio of the displacement of our cylinder. In this instance, I've called that the displacement of our piston head over the displacement of our accumulator. So let's say, for example, the displacement of our cylinder is going to be something we've introduced previously as the stroke length. So stroke length is the same thing as the displacement of the piston head. And for the purpose of this question, let's say we have a stroke length of half a meter. So L equals 0.5 meters. Now the thing we're trying to find is the displacement of our accumulator that causes our cylinder to fully extend. Now we can't calculate that directly, but we can use the second part of the formula for movement ratio, which is the diameter of the accumulator squared over the diameter of the piston head squared. Now, because this is a ratio, we can actually work in millimeters and we would get exactly the same answer as to if we were to work in meters. So to keep things simple, we have 220 squared divided by 42 squared. And that's going to give us our movement ratio of 27.44. It's a ratio, so it doesn't have any units. So now we can use the formula movement ratio equals displacement of piston head over displacement of accumulator in order to determine the displacement of our accumulator. Because we have XA equals XH divided by the movement ratio. Now we've said the displacement of our piston head is essentially the same thing as our stroke length. And our movement ratio is 27.44. So 0 0.5 over 27.44 equals 0 0.018 meters. Okay, so let's just consider what this means. This means that in order for our cylinder to fully extend, through its stroke length of half a meter, the piston rod is being displaced by 0.5 meters. Now in doing so, our accumulator also displaces. And by the displacement of the accumulator, we mean how far does this move down? We're calling that the distance XA. So in order for our cylinder to fully extend, our accumulator is going to move down by a distance of 0.018 meters. So just a fraction of the displacement of the cylinder. In effect, we have a type of lifting machine because we have a large force or the weight moving through a small distance and causing a much larger displacement with a smaller force at the cylinder. So as we would expect, the force on the accumulator is high whilst the displacement is low and the force on the cylinder is low whilst the displacement is high, particularly when compared to the accumulator. So just to summarize, in this video, we've calculated the mass required in order to pressurize our oil, and we've also compared the displacement of the cylinder to the displacement of the accumulator during one full extension of the cylinder.